Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody in the house of God this morning. Are you guys excited to be here? Are you excited to worship? Because I am. I know that, you know, a lot of us might have a, a lot of stuff going on, the enemy coming against you. But let me just tell you, you've got the victory. If you have given your life to Jesus, you've got the victory. But guess what? That means we can sing like the battle's over. There's a praise that breaks the silence, a sound that slays the giants, a voice that breaks down every prison door. When we lift our voices, praises go before us, for we know the battle is the Lord. I'm going to sing, because I'm going to sing like the battle is over. I'm going to dance like the war is won. Every prison door swing open wide, the king is overcome. I remember every victory, how he wrote my story, moment that I crossed from death to life. So if the battle rages, I'm safe here in your presence, for I know he's never lost a fight. I'm going to sing, because I'm going to sing. Like the battle is over, cause I'm gonna dance like the war is won. Every prison door swing open wide, the king is overcome. Cause I'm gonna sing like the battle is over, and I'm gonna dance like the war is won. Every prison door swing open wide, the king is overcome. Victory is mine before my eyes can see it. Now there's nothing that can keep me from my promise. No, I won't be moved. My hopes in you is light breaks through the darkness. Now there's nothing that can keep me from my promise. Victory is mine before my eyes. Now there's nothing that can keep me from my promise. No, I won't be moved. My hopes in you as light breaks through the darkness. Now there's nothing that can keep me from my promise. Victory is mine. Victory is mine before my eyes can see it. And there's nothing. Now there's nothing that can keep me from my promise. No, I won't be moved. My hopes in you, the light breaks through the darkness. Now there's nothing that can keep me from my promise. Cause I'm gonna sing like the battle is over. I'm gonna dance like the war is won. Every prison door swing open wide. The king is overcome. I'm gonna sing like the battle is over. The war is won. Every prison door swing open wide. The king is overcome. He's overcome. We've Good to be here and so good to see each of you 
And if you happen to be a visitor with us this morning, we just certainly want to welcome you. And we just hope that, that you'll be touched this morning, that you'll continue to visit with us. And it is just wonderful to be here this morning. In a few moments, we're going to open with prayer. We're going to give you the opportunity to worship through your giving. And uh, let me just say, we had a wonderful service last Sunday morning. Easter in the Park. And if you missed that, you missed something. We had over 200 people there. And uh, we just had a wonderful time. And, and I know we had some visitors there. And if they're not here this morning, hopefully uh, we planted the seed, right? And that they will join with us. But uh, we just want to thank you and thank him uh, for last Sunday morning. It, it was just a wonderful time. Before we open with prayer, I do want to do make a couple of comments, a few announcements here. The ladies will be meeting after the morning service, so if that's you, you want to meet with the ladies group, they'll meet over here. It won't take long, just a few moments, so after service this morning. Also, we want to remind you that if you need to sign up for camp, youth camp, if you need to sign up or you need to sign somebody else up, uh, there's no better time take care of that then today. So if you meet with Terry and Sherry after church this morning, uh, start to do that. Uh, I know the deadline is coming up soon, so if you would, just uh, take care of that this morning. Um, as wonderful as last Sunday was, this is a brand new day. This is a new day, a, a, a day in which uh, we want to worship afresh and anew. So that's what we're here for this morning. And uh, your beautiful congregation, if, if nobody else has told you this morning, you look good. Husbands, remember those things. So you look good, and I know that you're a beautiful sight in God's eyes this morning. So um, if you have a need, just raise your hand this morning. You have a need that you know only God can, can handle. And this morning, pray for one another. You know, that's, that's, that's what God calls for us to do, is, is to... Stand in for one another, to be the strength for one another, to pray for one another. If you have a need, this morning it should be the need of all of us. And we just want to stand together as a, as a church body this morning and a people who love, who love God. And it's just wonderful to worship with you this morning and uh, just pray for one another. Also, I want, to, I want to add, keep the Bagley family in mind this morning as they have lost their matriarch. Um, so just pray for them this morning that uh, the, dark, the dark days ahead, that, that God would give them strength and that uh, he would light their path and uh, that he would make these things bearable. So if you would, let's just go to him in prayer this morning. Let's just usher his sweet presence into this place and let's just, let's just love him this morning and tell him what he means to us. Just ask that he would work this morning before us. Gracious Heavenly Father, God, how we praise you this morning. We thank you for this glorious day. We're just thankful for your allowing us, your calling us together this morning that we would worship and serve you, Father. And uh, we just thank you for the wonderful gift that you have given us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, this morning, we ask that you would forgive us of those things which are against you, those things which we have done. We ask that you would forgive us this morning, that you would call us back to you Father, that you would allow us to worship and serve you, that we might receive your full blessing this morning. Father, we are so thankful for those who have gathered here. And Father, for the hands that have gone up in this place, for the needs that those hands represent. And Father, you know what's in our heart. You know the things that we need. But, but we stand and we pray for one another this morning, asking that you would touch. God, that you would be merciful, that you would grant healing. Father, that you would break the chains that bind. God, that you would restore relationships this morning, that you would bless the finances of your people. God, we know that you have the answer for whatever our issue is, and we stand on faith this morning, and we believe, Father, that you will touch and that you will do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. Father, this morning, we ask that you would speak to us through your word. God, that you would just call us. Father, that you would just give us a longing in our heart to know to know a, a more of who you are, that we would just dedicate ourselves to you. Father, that we would have a desire to, to be filled by your Spirit, 
and that we would be accepting of the way that you want to work in us and the uses that you have for us. We just want to be available to you. And we just want to be deserving of your love and of that power and of that touch this morning. Father, we're so grateful for your blessings in this life. For the material things that, that we need that you bless us with. The jobs. Father, this morning it is, it is an honor to worship you through our giving. Father, we give back to you that which is rightfully yours. We just ask that you would accept our tithes, our offerings. Father, that you'll bless these things, that you will multiply them, use them to the glory of your kingdom, that you would cause this church, Father, to, to use these monies the way that you direct. That's what we want to be about, is your business. And we just ask that you would lead us in all things that we do. Father, speak to us this morning. God, cause us to do the things that, that make us truly deserving of, of your love and this mercy that we talk about. The gifts that you have for us. Call us this morning. Father, we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Bravo, bravo, get over here, bravo. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Hey, I need you to flink right. Frank light. On my go, on my go, on my go. Man, they're they're close to us. They're gonna get us if we don't if we don't get this right right here. Alright. Bravo, go, 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 go. No, oh, bravo! No! Oh! <sighs> No! Okay, okay, okay. We're gonna need air support. We're gonna need air support. We're gonna need air support. We're gonna make it. Alpha on the command. Alpha on the command. I need air support. I need air support. Echo. One, two, three. Delta. Four, five, six. Do you copy? Alpha on the command. Do you copy? Do you copy? Do you copy? What? Ah! I guess I'm on my own. I don't know what's gonna happen. No! And the actress of the year goes to <laughs> Madeline. <laughs> oh my goodness. You couldn't really hear it, but she actually walks up behind me and she goes, I'm your commander now. Oh man, that, that, that laugh at the end was not playing. That was just her. Praise God. We want to invite you though to this Saturday, 4 to 6 p.m. to Nerf and Nachos. Um, this is being put on by Children's Church with Sister Sherry. But this is open to all my young adults that want to get beat by the youth. Come on down. Um, we, we, we're, there's going to be bullets provided or nerf, nerf darts provided, 2,000 of them. We're going to have some goggles for the kids so you don't shoot your eye out. Um, <coughs> um, but my kids have dead aim. They will get you. Um, 
Come on, my goodness. They always go for your face. So the goggles are necessary, safety glasses, but definitely bring your Nerf guns. Uh, this would be a great time of family and fellowship. We're going to have some obstacle courses set up, some uh, pallets and spools set up, and other, other things set up out there where you can hide behind. And we'll have some just fun time of fellowship. And I'm excited for it. I think it's going to be good. It's going to be a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of good things there. But I'm also excited because we're seeing so much growth in our church and in all of our departments. And I want to specifically honor some teen talent participants this morning. Come on. Of course, we had our Wednesday night service, service, and they did phenomenal in our showcase. But then they went to the talent showcase in um, Ottawa, and they just did amazing. And they did, I was so proud of them. The nerves were gone. They got up there, and Caitlin will say, no, they weren't where she's at. <laughs> but you know what? They did a great job, and they just got up there. They performed. I couldn't be prouder. The parents that were there, we couldn't be more proud of, of what they did. Um, by stepping out. We learned a lot. We got a lot of feedback from the, the judges, so we know what we need to work on. But our worship team, if you're part of the worship team, I want you to kind of just stand right here. Come on up. Come on up, worship team. <laughs> they liked us so well, they broke our trophy. They were like, man, Manchester, come in here. No, no. <laughs> But uh, these young lady, young men, they got third place in the state of Tennessee for worshiping. Amen. Amen. First place for bow string instrument was Caitlin Skipper. And I was able to uh, video call with Brother Josh during that time, and it was awesome. Um, he did amazing. And then... Third place out of the 22 solo female vocalists that showed up to at that event. That was the most, the biggest category they had, the most entries. Third place goes to Alyssa Hemphill. So all these students have the opportunity to go to the International uh, Teen Talent Showcase um, later this summer. So we're excited about that. Continue to pray for this team. And we just want to honor the Lord today for what he's doing and you guys, can, you guys can stay up here and worship or be seated. Um, but we want to honor the Lord. If you love to be in the house of the Lord, can you just say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Because He wants to minister to your heart. He wants to speak a word into you. But He wants us to humbly come before Him. And so we're going to get right back into worship. I, just, I feel like I'm supposed to lead us in prayer real quick. For the, for the blessing God's given us. I was thinking earlier, may his face shine upon us. May his favor be for us. May he surround us in the front, the back. He's with us always. He's so good to us. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for your blessing. God, we thank you, Lord, for your, your power and your might that you bestow upon us, Lord God, for your favor. And Lord, we ask that you just move in a mighty way. Heavenly Father, we invite you into this time of worship. Lord, we invite your spirit, Lord, to be poured out on us, Lord God. Lord, if there is sickness and pain, if there are those, Lord God, that are here today that just need a touch from you, Lord Jesus, Lord, I pray, Lord, that they meet you at the well. Oh, that they meet you at the well, Lord, and offer them, Lord God, the only drink that can fill their cup, the only drink, Lord God, that can satisfy their soul, and that's you, Lord Jesus. Oh, minister to us, Lord Jesus. Move in a mighty way. In the name of the Lord we pray. Amen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance 
When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made Chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was around, so he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace. Oh, Rejoices though heaven had lost. But then Jesus rose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, oh, your grace, so free. Watch it. this listen we've been talking about identity in my young adult class because I think there's an identity crisis in the world today people don't know who they are but let me tell you as a believer you're not who your past says you are your identity is not in who you used to be your identity is not even this your identity is in Christ Jesus because the Bible tells us that he took all of us all of whatever we had and put it on himself and he died with it. Your past, all your mistakes, who you used to be, the nicknames you used to go by because they, people knew you by that. All that died with Christ Jesus. But guess what? He rose again. And he was the first of many brethren. We are heirs and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. If you want to know who you are, understand who God is. When you understand who he is, you know who you are through him. Hey, we can sing this song. We're free, we're free, forever we're free. Get a hold of that. It'll change your life.
I want to encourage you. We're going to sing that part again. We lift our hands. We surrender all of us. We're surrendering to God. God, not my will be done, but your will be done. And let me tell you, his will is that you prosper in every area of your life. His will is that you're healed and made whole. His will is that all of the old past things have died and you are now a new creation in him. That's his will. So I want to encourage you as we sing this part again, raise up them hands, raise up those hands, and let's just, let's, let's surrender to him. We're free, we're free, forever we're free. And come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, we're free forever. my prayer this morning is through all the busyness all the hustle and bustle of life Lord that we don't lose that fire for you that wildfire would you set our fire so set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain that I can't control I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. I 
soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. You set a fire in our hearts, God. First love.
this morning and just lift our hands and just worship him and just glorify his name just acknowledge who he is Jesus I worship your name I worship your name I worship your name worthy you are worthy you are worthy we worship your name we worship your name we worship your name. 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 Today, Father, I declare that I need you. Today, I, I acknowledge that I can't do this without you. Oh, but when I do it with you, Father, you bless me. You help me. You walk with me. Oh, in the name of Jesus. We worship your name. We worship your name. We worship your name. Oh, Father, we worship you. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. You may be seated this morning. I want to just say thank you to our worship team. Our children are going to Children's Church now. They stayed in for the Nerf Nachos video. They wanted to see Madeline eat nacho chips. <laughs> Amen. I do want to say last Sunday, wow, we had such a great crowd. It turned out to be a beautiful day. I had a couple people tell me, they said, Pastor, I was afraid I was going to be cold. The interesting thing was if you were out there, <laughs> about 1145, we were looking for shade trees. It got hot. I mean, I think even Brother Jones would have got hot out there. I don't know. <laughs> Some of you probably don't know. He, he's cold in July. About July 6th, he's still wearing a sweater. But um, uh, great service. Wanted to say thanks to all the people that helped, helped us get that together. We had a, several people that just, yeah, amen. We had several people that, <clears throat> that worked hard that week and uh, the day of and just really, really, really just, just did a great job and just want to say thank you to them. Uh, I, we're just excited about what God is doing. Amen. Turn with me this morning to the book of Isaiah, the 44th chapter. Isaiah 44. And I want to talk to you this morning about the blessing. Amen. Jesus, last week, we celebrated his resurrection. We celebrated an empty tomb. Every religion in the world has a founder or a leader, has a um, some kind of prophet who is dead and is not coming back. But I want you to know that we serve a God who is alive. Amen. Amen. So I want to talk to you this morning about the blessing. I want to read this passage, uh, verses 1 through 4 in Isaiah 44. This is... <clears throat> Let me give you just a little bit of background. Isaiah, um, man, what a, if, if you've read up on Isaiah and you, you, you've you read up on uh, just his time period, where he's at and kind of what's going on in his life, there is a really, it's a really troubled time. There's a, the, the first several chapters of Isaiah, there's a lot of, um, captivity and stuff going on. Israel is being sieged and there's just all kinds of things that's happening. And um, there's just um, massive armies that uh, are all around Israel and they're, they're wanting that land. Um, uh, one of the best pieces of property within several thousand miles is that little uh, slice of Israel right there. It is the absolute perfect little place. You have water, you have um, just so much. Um, I don't know if anybody's been to Turkey, anybody's been to uh, Egypt or uh, Iran, Iraq, any of those places. Um, you gotta, you got to hunt and hike for water. And, uh, Israel has got water. They've got all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's just a blessed country. And those other kingdoms wanted Israel. They wanted Israel. They wanted that land. It's a shipping port. It's on the coast. There's just, there's just thousands of great reasons to have that land. And Israel is surrounded by these, these huge 
these countries that have these massive armies that are just, you know, 10, 15 times their size. And <clears throat> Israel is struggling. They're, they're, there's just this constant thing where they struggle to live right. And God is blessing them. God's taking care of them. And in Isaiah 44, he gives them some direction and he talks to them. Several chapters before this, it talks about the brokenness of Israel. But in chapter 44, he talks about how he wants to bless them. And I want to talk to you this morning about Isaiah 44 because we, hopefully everyone in here, you have received Christ. Christ is in your life, and he is doing something in your life. He's working in your life. And when he came out of the grave, he was nailed to that cross. He did that. For, he covered your sin. He took care of your fight, your struggle. He, he paid for that. And so Isaiah 44 is talking about that blessing the blessing that God wants to put on Israel, but also the blessing that's coming when um, Jesus is resurrected. So Isaiah 44, verse 1 says this, Yet hear me now. So he's saying, listen to me. Anybody ever anybody ever had your mother to call you middle name? And they said, David Allen, you better... And there's like a pause there, you know, and I was... We were with a family. It was probably, I don't know, six, eight weeks ago. I don't remember how long ago it was. We were with a family, and they have a little child, and the little child was running around, and the mother was like, Bobby, come here. Bobby, come here. And Bobby was whoop, whoop, whoop. And he's just spinning and running, and he's kind of just doing, you know. And the father said, Bobby, your mother said, get over here. And Bobby went, antennas went up. He went, what? Oh, oh, yeah. And he came over there and stood still. And I I told Carrie, I said, right there, he understood <laughs> things were going to get crazy if Dad, if Dad has to talk to him again. <laughs> and uh, I just thought it was, I, we, we laughed a little bit. It was real funny. And, uh, but here, God is speaking to Israel, and he says, hear me now. I need you to listen to me. Listen to me. This is one where you turn the TV off, you, you shut the laptop, you pull the top down on the laptop, you take your phone, you hit the little ringer, you turn your ringer off and you flip the face down so you can really focus in. Listen to me now. Hear me now. O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Jacob, my servant, Israel, who I have chosen. Verse 2 says this, Thus says the Lord, who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you, Fear not. Here's what he says. I don't know how many times this is in the Bible. I probably need to look it up. But it is over and over and over because here's what happens. In our life, what does the enemy love to do? He loves to put a little fear in us, right? If he can get you scared, he can mess you up, right? He can mess you up. All, he needs, all we need to do is get fearful, and we'll either fight crazy or we'll run crazy, right? But we're going to be crazy. O oh, Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun. Now, let's stop and say something on this real quick because somebody's going to say, what is that? Who's that? This is Israel. This is another name. Josh mentioned this about nicknames. He stopped and said this about nicknames. He didn't know that, that Israel was going to have their nickname in here. But this is a, like a term of endearment. This is like a little pet name. Anybody, anybody had... Anybody had a, a, a child when you, when you were growing up, you were a child, and your grandfather or somebody had a little name for you? When, you, when you'd come in, your grandfather or your grandmother would come in, and they'd call you little bit or something, or squirt or something like that, sweet, something like that. They'd call you a little name, you know, they had a little name for you. This is, this is here, this is what God is, he's talking to Israel, and he's saying, he's, I'm going to call you by your nickname so you know that I love you. You know, this is, this is getting personal. This is not just business, but this is personal here. This is personal. And he goes on and he says, whom I have chosen. Man, somebody needs to, somebody, uh, right there, it's a good place to write that down. He has chosen me, right? Let's move on to verse 3. We're going to come back and work through this again, but I want to read through it. For I will pour water on him who is thirsty, and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants. 
and my blessing on your offspring. Verse 4. They will spring up, they will spring up among the grass like willows by the water courses. One passage, one uh, version that I read, it said like poplars near the stream. This is a strong tree. This is not a tree that, this is not just a little, uh, just a little tree that's going to grow up, be six, eight foot tall, ten foot tall. No, this is a good, stout tree that people are going to come and get under when it's hot. They're going to come and sit under that tree because that tree is going to perform a great service of, of giving them shade and giving them food and doing all kinds of good things. So here's what, this is what God says to Israel. So here's, let me say this, one of the things that God is asking Israel to do is he's asking them to walk in an upright way before him. In a, in a moral way, he's asking Israel, before, before they can get to this, before they get the blessing, here's what he says, I need you to make sure that there's some morality in your life. And the interesting thing, in the world that we live, this, this culture where the culture says, there's nothing wrong anymore. I, you know, there's nothing wrong. You can do whatever you want. You can go wherever you want. But the interesting thing is we know that Scripture is very deliberate and very very poignant about we have to live right. There's, there's boundaries on things. There's things that you don't do. There's places that you don't go. And so one of the things that God asks us to do, if we want His blessing, if we want His favor, if we want His presence, He asks. He asks us to live right and to live clean lives and to do our best. Here, here's the truth of this. Every person in here, somewhere down the road, you're going you're gonna to make a mistake. You're going to miss. Somewhere you're, you're going to miss. Somewhere you're going to mess up. And that, the, the enemy loves that. He loves that when, when we miss. Because what he's going to do is he's going to put that on a banner or a billboard in town and say, Bobby missed. He messed up, and he did wrong. Boy, it was bad. It was bad. Man, wow. Shame on him. He should feel bad for what he did. But the truth of it is, we are broken creatures. We live in a broken world, and we will never be perfect until we get to heaven. But what we do is we constantly try and we constantly say, God, help me to live right. God, help me to do this thing. I want to have clean hands and a pure heart. That's what the Bible tells us that, that we need is clean hands and a pure heart. God, this is what I'm trying to do. This is where, I'm, where I want to be, God. I want to have clean hands and a, and a pure heart. How I think about things, what I think about, where I go, what I do, but what I touch and what I say. God, help me to live right. Help me to live right. Not only that, but God wants us, there's two other things that he wants in our lives. He wants us to love God and love people. To love God and love people. And here's the thing about this. Sometimes it's not always easy to love God. There are moments in time. Anybody ever had a situation where somebody... You, you prayed over something, you felt like God directed you into something, and you got there, you get there, you live in it, and within a year or so, you say, God, where, where and what have you done in my life? My goodness, you have brought me to destruction. You have brought me to a, a, this is a train wreck. I don't know what you've put me in. And we can get upset at God. We can get a little disappointed. I think it's okay for us to admit that. We can be disappointed about what's happened in our life. Anybody ever lost a loved one? Anybody ever had a grandmother that was 65 and she was the best thing since sliced bread and you loved her and everything and she got cancer and died? And there's somebody that lived down the street from you and they were mean as a, as a striped snake and they lived to be 81 and they cheated and stole and spit on people their whole life and you said, my goodness, God, take him, don't take my grandmother. Sometimes we can be, there can be some conflict there, and those things can be difficult to understand. But here's what we do is we love God. We love God, and we love people. Because sometimes it's real easy to love people, isn't it? 
got that little grandbaby? And you're like, and he comes over there and he goes, my fault, my fault, you can go, here I come. And he's like, and Dan's like, that's your boy right there. He's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And you love him, you, man, I tell you what, you, it, when the, when I was five, six years old, we'd go down the road and I'd say, Dad, can we stop McDonald's and get a milkshake? My dad'd be like, no way. Going to the house. You can drink water when you get home. We got bread and water at the house. It's a pan of cornbread that's been there for three or four days. You can eat that, you know. Man, my brother, my brother, when, when he had kids, they'd drive down the highway, and one of them would say, Papa, can we have a milkshake? <laughs> Slide that car in there. How many? Which one you want? You want the big one? You know. And I said, oh, "Time out. What happened, man? You would. <laughs> we lived on bread and water, split wood for entertainment. Grandkids come along, and I mean, it's just, what do you want? What do you want? Loving people. Sometimes loving people are easy. Sometimes loving people can be difficult. But here's what we know that we're supposed to do. We're supposed to love people. There's some things that aren't always easy. But when we do these things, when we walk right before God, when we love God, when we love people, here's what happens. We get to verse 2. We get those things set up. We get those things kind of worked out. We get to verse 2. Verse 2 says this. The Lord who made you and formed you from the womb. So he, he describes and he tells who he is. He signs off on this word. I am the God who formed you. I was the one who knitted you in your mother's womb. I made you. I want you to know who's speaking to you. It's almost like you're in a dark room and somebody's talking in that room and you can't see their face, you can hear their voice, it's a little distant and you're trying, it's almost like you're saying, now who is that that's talking to me? And when it's clarified, when you find out who's talking to you, it makes a difference who's talking to you. And God right here says, I, don't, I want you to understand, Isaiah's bringing the word, but the word's coming from me. This is not just Isaiah talking. Isaiah has plenty of things to say. The man can speak, the guy can go out and talk, the guy can can probably talk about politics or whatever, but right now he's saying what I said to him. And this is what I'm saying to you. The first thing that he says is he says, listen, this is what God is saying to you. Your creator, he said, I want you to fear not. I want you to fear not. Don't fear. Remove fear from your life. You have to remove it from your life. Because here's what the enemy loves. The enemy loves a little fear, because fear leads to quitting. If the enemy can get you to get scared, this is a this is a, a, a thing that's been studied for hundreds of years. It's called fight or flight. When you get in a, a awkward situation, you're going to do one of two things. You're going to start fighting, or you're going to run. You're going to fight, or you're going to run. There's a couple of dogs came in my yard about probably about six, eight months ago, maybe a little farther back than that. It might have been a year ago. A couple of dogs came in my yard. And my two dogs were out in the yard. And the interesting one of my dogs ran out and started chewing on one of those dogs. My other dog, I thought, where did Millie go? I looked around, and she had run back to the house. And she was standing on the porch looking around the corner going, oh, <laughs> they're not coming up here, are they? And I said, look at that. I got one dog that's out here trying to fight and protect the home. And I got one dog that's trying to figure out an exit strategy. <laughs> this is what the enemy wants us to do. The enemy wants us to either get crazy fighting and just get silly and just lose our cool and just start doing things and going crazy. And just get out of control or he wants us to do the other thing where we run and hide. So this is what God said. God said, here's what I need you to understand. I need you to put this in your purse. I need you to put this in your backpack. I need you to put it in your little belt. I need you to understand this. Do 
not fear. Because here's what's going to happen. The enemy's coming. And he's going to come, and you know what he's going to do is he's going to show up, and he's not going to, he doesn't show up and say, hey, let's have a cup of coffee. No, he's going to show up and say, I'm your friend, but guess what? World's ending. And we're in a political storm. This thing's only going to get worse. Gas is going to $7 a gallon. Green beans is going to go to $2 a can. Oh, man, you know what beef's going to be in three years? You know how high beef's going to be in three years? Oh, man, it's going to be so high. Chinese own all the pork. They bought all the, they bought all the pork. They own all the, the big farms out in the West. In the next six years, they're going to raise all the prices. They're going to run us out of business. Now, there's a little truth to that, I think. But here's what God is saying. Understand who holds this thing together. Understand who's got a hold. Understand who controls this entire thing. I, it, there, there's things that are going on that, if we didn't have God, we should probably be fearful right now. But I want to tell you something. I want to just say this. I suggest to grab a hold of this. Do not fear all the craziness that's going on. You can't let this stuff get in you. Do not fear. Because the enemy loves, this is one of his best tools. Anybody ever been fishing? Anybody ever fished artificial lures? When you're fishing... When I was a kid, I was about 12, 13 years old. We had some ponds behind our house, and me and a buddy of mine, Dwayne Campbell, we'd go fishing every day after school for about an hour. My mom would be coming home from work, and she would say, you getting your homework done? And I'd be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and we were catching bass, and I had a little lure called, it was a broken Rapala. It was a little minna, and that thing would, that thing would kick across the water. And that was, when I wasn't catching anything, I'd have to tie that on because I knew there was a few that just couldn't lay off of it. This is what the devil does. He's got some tricks, and one thing that he's got is fear. He loves to pour that out. Here's what God said. Don't fear. Fear. You've got you to gotta get this out of your life. Proof of it is, it happens in our life. It happens. This is going to happen. It, it's part of what happens. We fear. Don't fear. Don't fear. Let's, let's go back to verse 2. I'm sorry. I, I felt like I was leaving it, but I'm coming back to it. The bottom half of that verse says, Whom I have chosen. Didn't we just, what, didn't somebody just say that during worship? You're not, dis, you're not discarded. Disqualified, yeah. You're not disqualified, but you're chosen. You're chosen. You're chosen. You've been picked. Here's what the enemy wants you to know. Here's what the enemy wants you to think. Here's what the enemy wants you to leave. Is that somebody else is better than you. Somebody else has is, is got that spot. Somebody else is here. Somebody else is there. Oh, here. Hear this. Hear what the word of the Lord is saying to you this morning. God has chosen you. He has. He. You. Are on his, you're on his refrigerator. He's got a picture of you. He's got a picture of you on his refrigerator. Somebody, it's probably been six, eight years ago, somebody in the church sent us a picture. Their son or daughter had graduated, and, and it came in a little envelope, and Sherry stuck that on the refrigerator. And it stayed there probably about a year. And one day they had to stop by our house and get something. I don't remember what it was. And they came in, and <laughs> we it's probably more that we just didn't take it down, you know. But they came in and they were like, "What? You still got my son on your picture?" What? I can't. I can't remember who it was. They're like, "You still got him on your on your refrigerator?" Wow. And we were like, "Yeah." And it kind of it was okay for me, but man, you talking about a mama coming in and seeing their baby on somebody's refrigerator? I want to tell you right now, God has got your picture hung up. He's looking at your picture. I want you to know that he said, I have chosen you. I've chosen you. I've chosen you. I've picked you. 
I picked you. I remember being nine years old, and in the little neighborhood that I lived, the seven, eight houses that were around us, there was a group of boys that would get together, and my brother was four years older than me, and my brother and another boy, Mark, they would always be the one who picked the teams for football. We'd play touch football. We were picking teams, and I was like nine, and they were all like 12, 13, 14, 15. And at the very end, I would be standing there. I'd be the only one left. And one of them would say, okay, we'll take him. Now, here's the thing it is. They didn't choose me. I was the last one, and nobody wanted me. But it was, we want to get the game started, so just put him on a team. No, you know what God is saying to you this morning? You're not just you're you're not just default falling on a team. No. He said a long time ago, when you were in your mother's womb, he said, I've chosen you. I have chosen you. I have picked you. I have something special for you. I have a job for you. I have something special for you. The enemy wants we have more depression in our society than we've ever had. We have more. We went through, what was it, 80 years ago, went through the Great Depression? And right now we're in the Great Depression. But the Great Depression right now is that people, we got a lot of people who are saying, I don't know where I belong. I don't know how to do this. I don't know if I can get up in the morning. No, you can get up in the morning because God has chosen you. God has chosen you. Wow, man, wouldn't that be great if we just stopped right there? But I want to read verse 3 to you. I want to read verse 3. Verse 3 says this, For I will pour water on him who is thirsty. This is what God is saying to you. I will pour water on him. Here's what I want to talk to you. I want to say this real quick. Here's what happens in life is we get thirsty. We, the, the wind will blow in our life. And it dries out the ground. And we get thirsty. Here's what the Bible says. It says, I will pour water on him who's thirsty. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour some water on him who's thirsty. I'm going to pour some water. You think that, he, that he's just going to, he's, you, you think he's going to do this right here? He's just going to, did it say, I will drip water on? Why are we good with the drip sometimes? Why is when the water starts dripping, we say, oh, that's enough, God. That's enough. That's enough, God. That's enough. I'm good. No, he said, this is what the word says. I'm going to pour it on you. I'm going to pour the water on you. I'm going to pour. He said, I'm going to pour that water on you. I'm going to pour. I'm going to pour it on that thirsty soul. That thirsty soul. That, that parched dry ground. Because I know this. If you live much in this old world, this world will dry you out. You will get dry and you will start to get hard and you'll start to get brittle brittle and you will just start to fade away but if we will just stop for a minute and say father your word and isaiah 44 it tells me that you pour water on my thirsty dry ground and god i believe in who you are and i understand god that when you speak it your word will not return void and i'm going to trust you oh god that you're going to pour some water on me but he doesn't stop there he said and floods on the dry ground. Floods on the... See, here's the difference between a little rain, and I don't have enough bottle in my enough water in my bottle for the flood. I thought about getting Tim to bring the five-gallon bucket, and we would just pour it out on the congregation. But here's, here's what happens in a flood. A flood is more water than the ground can handle. It's more water than what the... See, the ground has usually has a natural drain, and we have these little wet areas, little swamps, we call them swamps, little uh, wetlands, and those wetlands will catch the water, and that water will catch in those wetlands, and that water will slowly let that water down into the water table, and it'll filter it out, and that keeps water down in the water table. And as we're pumping water out of the ground, and we're, where do we get our water out of our faucet? Somewhere they're pumping it out of the ground, pumping it out of the lake. But those wetlands, they're slowly letting that water down. And the ground well, has this little natural flow, and everything flows down, and it goes. 
But when it floods, what happens is, is the, the natural system that holds the water, it gets overrun, and it's too much water for the natural system. And so what God is saying to us here in the third verse is not only am I going to pour water on thirsty people, but at times I'm going to pour more water than what you can contain. God, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for what you're doing. God, you have poured too much on me. But here's what we, we don't say. Oh, God, just sprinkle me with that a little bit. No, we say, God, I'm ready for the flood. I'm ready, oh, God, for the flood. So as we read on, I'm almost finished. As we read on, he says this, and I will pour my spirit on your descendants. I will pour my spirit on your descendants. Isaiah, this is a direct reference to the day of Pentecost. Directly talking about Pentecost. But he's talking about, he's talking about the people of Israel. He's talking about the people of just the people of the world, he said, I'm going to pour my spirit out on your descendants. I'm going to pour my spirit. And when he talks about pouring, remember, we just I just made a little illustration here. He didn't say, I'm going to sprinkle the spirit. I'm just going to, oh, I think I, I, think I felt a drop of the spirit. Let's, let's wait and see if we feel another drop. Maybe there's another, maybe there'll be another drop. We were out playing, uh, we were at baseball practice, what was it, probably about two weeks ago. And we were out there, maybe three weeks ago, we are out there at baseball practice, and the, they had said it was about 30% chance of rain. And I, I looked at the radar, and, and just probably seven, eight miles from us, there was a green spot on the radar, right moving right toward Manchester. And I said, oh boy, we may get wet out here. And we, we, we were just getting out there on the field, getting ready to start practice, and one of the coaches said, I just got hit in the head with a raindrop. I just felt that. It just it hit me right here. And a minute later, there was another little raindrop. But you know what happened? Within about four or five minutes, it was all over. All we got was about ten drops of rain that we knew about. And there was just a couple of drops that just kind of touched us and just kind of hit us. That wasn't what he said in verse 3. No, what he said in verse 3, he said, I've got a bucket of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to pour it out on you. I'm going to pour out the Spirit on your descendants. I'm going to pour my Spirit on your descendants. And then he goes on and he says, I mean, that's great right there. And that's like, I'm good to stop right there. I'm like, oh, God, just pour out your Spirit, oh, God. Pour out your Spirit, God. We need your Spirit, God. In these last days, we need your Spirit. We need you to pour out your Spirit. And I'm so thankful, God, that you're pouring out your spirit. But then he goes on and he says this. And my blessing on your offspring. And my blessing, God's blessing on your offspring. Here's what I've come to tell somebody this morning. I've come to tell somebody that you are in the right place to receive the things that God has promised you. But here's what happens. If, we're, if, if we just let it pass us by, if we don't stop and say, God, I'm, I'm here, and I've read your word, and I understand what your word says, and I'm, I, God, I want to receive what you have for me, because <clears throat> here's how it happens. He's given it out. But we have to come and get it. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that be great if, if you were in the bed one morning and your spouse calls to you and says, I've got breakfast made. And just, I want you to take just a minute and think what, when we go to my mom's, she always makes pancakes. And she'll fry up some sausage and some bacon. And then the thing that I love is she always has like some raspberries and some blueberries. And she'll slice oranges or apples, and there may be some strawberries. She always has a bunch of fruit. And we'll go in there, and there's pancakes and all this stuff. And here's what my mom does is at 6 in the morning, she'll smell that bacon. And I'm sitting there asleep, and I go, bacon? Bacon? 
and I'll get up, and I'll go downstairs, and I'll go down there, and my mom's in there, and sometimes my dad's in there with a cup of coffee, and he's like, he's just in there supervising. But if I lay up there in the bed, guess what? She's not walking up those steps with no bacon. Pancakes aren't coming upstairs. They're not coming upstairs. But here's what happens. When I come down there, I can eat as much of that as I want. I want to tell somebody this morning, God's favor is for you. God's favor is for you. But you've got to say, God, God's, the Holy Spirit is for you. The Holy Spirit is for you. But we have to say, God, I'm, I want that. I need that water poured on that thirsty one. Josh, would you come this morning? You may be here this morning. Maybe you may be that dry, thirsty ground. Because here's what happens in life. Here's what happens in life. It wears us out. It dries us out. It dries us out. And we have to be renewed. We have to be refreshed. But sometimes we can't refresh ourselves. We went yesterday to that teen talent. We got up early in the morning, went over there. We were there, I don't know, what time did we leave? Five, six? Yeah. <laughs> it was somewhere around eternity. <laughs> when I... I when the skippers went out on a stretcher, I was like, I think we're leaving. <laughs> but we were so tired. When we got in the car and we were driving back after we'd been in the car about 45 minutes, we were so tired. But it was like a tiredness that we couldn't get. We couldn't. It was like just sitting in the car. We didn't get renewed. We didn't get refreshed. And that's the way we can be in life is, is we, we just get worn down. Here's what I come to tell somebody this morning. You've got water for your dry ground. You've got water for your dry ground. Not only does he have water for your thirsty ground, but there's times when he'll send a flood. Well, there have been times when the Holy Spirit has just settled down on me and and it was more than I could handle. I understood the psalmist David when he wrote, he said, my cup overflowed. He filled my cup, but he just kept pouring. And you said, why would he, when you held out your cup, why would he just keep pouring it? Because he wants us to understand that he has got more than what you can handle what you can hold my cup only holds so much but when God pours down in it, I'm reminded oh God remind me that you've got more than what what my cup can hold what it can hold oh God I pray right now pour your presence pour your spirit pour your spirit over this dry, dusty ground. Oh, God, one more time, revive us. One more time, renew us. Oh, God. Oh, God, I thank you. I thank you for what you did on the cross. It reminds me that you've set this thing up. It reminds me that you've got it all in your hands. Would you stand with us this morning? As Josh sings this song, I want to ask you this morning, if you're dry, thirsty ground, or maybe you're, maybe you're not just dry, thirsty ground, maybe there's, maybe there's just some kind of need that you have. Maybe, maybe you really grabbed a hold of that part that said the Holy Spirit said he was going to pour out his spirit on your descendants. that's you this morning, would you come? We're going to pour out some water on some dry ground this morning. Sing that for us, John.
you just receive that word this morning? Will you receive that word this morning? That he said that he chose you? He chose you? He chose you? Would you receive that word? Because here, here's what happens. Sometimes things aren't right. Things are not lining up. There's things that are out of place. Something happened 20 years ago. Something happened three years ago. Something happened yesterday. Things are not lined up. In our mind, we sit and think, God, I hear your word. You chose me. 
but it doesn't look like it. Let me say this. Experience does not outweigh the Word of God. Experience does not outweigh the Word of God. The Word of God always holds more value than experience. What I see never holds more value than what the Word says. Disciples were in the boat. They said, Jesus, don't you care that we die? Because their experience was, we're drowning. This is it. We're six miles from shore. Seven foot waves out here. Six foot waves. We can't. There's no way. When we get out of this boat, we get in the water, we're going to drown. We're going to struggle for 15 minutes, but then we're eventually going to, we're going to, just be exhausted and give up and go down. Jesus stands up and said, Waves, sit down. Sit down. See, his word was greater than what we, what we saw. I just want to tell you this morning, what you're seeing, if it doesn't match up with the word, hold on to the word. What you're seeing doesn't match up with the word, hold on to the word. And just say, God, what I'm seeing... It's not what you're saying. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold on to your word. And I'm just going to sit here and I'm just going to trust you and I'm going to believe you until your word is manifested. Until your word is what is in front of me. So if there's a mountain that needs to be moved in your life, let me say this. There's no mountain too big that God can't move it. Oh, and somebody's going to come this week and tell you how big the mountain is. Somebody's going to come this week and say, your situation is so bad. Oh, boy, I'm glad I'm not in your shoes. Woo! You're a bad shape, man. Oh, no. Oh, no. I serve a God that when they're six miles from shore and they have a 100% guarantee of dying, that he stands up in the boat and says, guess what? We're going to get rid of the wave. And he just says, he speaks, get this now, he speaks to the atmosphere. There is a low pressure that has come, moved into Israel, and that has got 60 mile an hour winds that's pushing those waves up that is causing a massive disturbance in these men's lives. And Jesus, right now, it wasn't that he just spoke to the waves. But he spoke in the entire atmosphere. That low pressure dissolved within a matter of seconds. Somebody over in Lebanon, about 40 miles away from the Sea of Galilee, somebody said, Martha, it looks like we're going to get rain. And she walks out and looks out the window and says, You're crazy. There's nothing out there. Oh, Jesus spoke and the storm went away. But the enemy's saying, boy, you're in a pickle now. You got it now. Uh-uh. God, I trust you. I'm going to put my hope and my faith in you. I don't know how you're doing it. I'm not even going to try to figure it out. Let's try that. Put that shoe on and wear it. God, I'm not going to try to figure it out. I'm not even going to. I love to figure out what God's doing. Anybody ever do that? God, I got $5 in my pocket. $5 says, you're going to do it like this and this. I, I don't think one time he's ever, when I, when I start thinking about how he's going to do it, I think that may have been his plan, but he gets frustrated with me and he says, I'm not going to do it like that. I'm telling you, what we do is we say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. But I'm praying right now for my son. I'm praying right now for my daughter. I'm praying right now for my grandkids. I'm praying for work. I'm praying over my finances, God. I'm praying over this. I'm praying over that. I'm praying over my marriage, whatever it may be. I'm praying over it. God, I don't understand how you're doing this. 
but I know you're doing it. I know you've got a hold of it. And I know that when you show up, things happen. Amen. Oh, praise God. I just feel God wanting to say to somebody, fear not, I've chosen you. I'm going to pour out my spirit on you and your descendants. And what was dry ground will be will be fertile, growing land. Hear that. Hear that. Wrap that up. Stick it in your backpack. Because in a year from now, in two years from now, you're going to pull that out. And the word of the Lord will be standing in front of you. Amen. I believe it. I believe it. If my wife was in here, she would say, all right, let's go. Wrap it up. Ladies meeting right now, as soon as we pray, right? Jan, pray over us as we go.